as we continue talking about payment, we go into those billable days and non-billable days. So what is a billable day? A billable day is any data service where an individual is a resident of the home. Documentation of services refer to OAC 5123-930 and 5123-931. We said earlier in our presentation that DODD is working with ODM and CMS on some documentation service guides so that the providers and county boards can have something substantial in hand for when they get audited or something on a data service that Jessica actually wasn't present in. Those non-billable days, a day where an individual is admitted in an ICF or nursing facility. The provider must mark the non-billable days within the actuals using the non-billable day calendar, and then MRC will recalculate the DBU once all actuals are entered for the month. We're going to show you what that DBU looks like when those non-billable days are in effect for a month. So providers, this is backwards from what you do today. Today, when you go in your bill, you check the box for the day for each person that they received the service. Under MRC, you only check the box for a day that is not billable. And the only days that will not be billable are if the individual has been admitted to an ICF, if the individual has been admitted to a nursing home, or if the individual has moved out. So we have now introduced a new concept under MRC that wasn't there before. So the vast majority of people on Medicaid waivers in Ohio receive services under the supported living statute. In other words, not in a licensed home. There are still a couple thousand people that are in licensed homes, which is a little different than unlicensed homes, but in an unlicensed home, there has never been this concept of admission and discharge because there's no bed. Well, now the concept is, do you live there or do you not live there? I always use the reference, if my clothing is still in the dresser and my dresser is still in the bedroom and my bowling ball is still in the closet, that means I live there. And so until those things are removed, this is still my home. So when you're thinking about this and whether or not a person still lives there or not, this becomes very critical when we start to talk about EVV. This is not an EVV presentation, but we're going to bring it up because how it has changed has effects on EVV. So under EVV, the only litmus test for whether or not you are subject to EVV or not is if the Homemaker Personal Care Service is billed by a 15-minute unit or not by a 15-minute unit. So if it's a 15-minute unit, it is subject to EVV. If it is not a 15-minute unit, it is not subject to EVV. So all of the two-person sites in the state may be subject to EVV overnight because someone might move out, someone might die. That would make you subject to EVV the next day because the other person who is living by themselves now would be billed on 15-minute unit basis. The good news about MRC is, is that if that individual is in the hospital or that individual is in a nursing home because they are recovering from something that they were in the hospital for and it's going to be a short-term stay and everybody expects them to come back, then they are not taken out of MRC. It will still be a daily billing unit for the individual that is there by themselves and it will not be subject to EVV. So the good news behind MRC is now we have this concept of whether or not a person still lives there or does not live there. And as long as they live there, we're not going to change the status of that site to a 15 minute billing unit. We're gonna leave it as a daily billing unit. So we'll also show you, so since Gary brought up EVV, we'll also go through and show you um, what 
CPT and MRC can do for you as well. So, you know, like Gary said, a two-person site very easily overnight can become EVV eligible. Also, when we are cost projecting, so right now my site is, you know, once we have a site that has been finalized and authorized, a provider can go in and enter the actuals. What you also can look at on the projected cost page is that max DBU. For each month, there is, on to the far right of the columns, there is a max DBU button. If that max DBU says yes, then for that month, that site is mandatory and eligible for EVV. So max DBU right now is 50830. So if the daily billing unit for Jessica reaches 508.31, she has reached her max DBU and she will have to be billed at a 15 minute unit. Now that site has to do EVV. What we've heard from some of the providers who have gone through EVV training is that they're just doing EVV regardless of anything. That way they don't have to worry about past EVV claims or how to get past EVV dates into an EVV system. They don't have to worry about anything, they're just doing it. There's no harm, no foul to that. When you submit your billing to DODD, if you're billing the DBU billing code, it's an ADL claim. When we send over to MITS, we will send over that ADL claim. When MITS receives that ADL claim, they are not going and looking for an EVV claim to go with it because it's already exempt from EVV. So they will just go ahead and pay it out. If we don't send over that ADL claim, we send over the 15 minute billing unit claim, that is when they go look for those EVV claims. And if you don't have an EVV claim in there, then obviously you're not gonna get paid for it. So you can know ahead of time by when cost projection is done, those months that you will be subject to EVV. Also, it is up to you as a provider. So let's say my max DBU for Jessica is 508.31. 508.30 is the max DBU. Is it really worth 31 cents for that month to do EVV? It may not be to where you can choose not to have to bill 508.31. You've got a little bit of flexibility there, whereas if it's that 508.31 provider, are you okay to get paid 508.30? Then you can go ahead and move forward with your DBU.